Hi, my name is Professor Tanya de Koning Ward, and I'm the specialty chief editor of the section Parasite and Host at Frontiers in Cellular and Infection Microbiology. I'm here with Professor David Fiddick, who's from Columbia University Medical Centre, who, together with Professor Kelly Chivali from the University of Cape Town, as well as Professor Elizabeth Ashley from the Lau Oxford Mahasot Hospital Wellcome Trust Research Unit, are one of the organisers of the Keystone Symposium meeting on malaria, confronting challenges from drug discovery to treatment. And this meeting is going to be held in Colorado as well as live streamed on April the 10th to the 13th this year. So welcome, David. Um, thanks for taking the time to chat to me today about uh, this particular conference. So I'm just going to start with asking you, what was your vision in organising this meeting and how does it stand out from others in the field in terms of uh, scope and perspectives? So I want to organize this because I think malaria really is at a pivotal moment. Uh, recently, the WHO revised the numbers. Um, best predictions and estimates are that uh, there are up to 627,000 deaths a year and 241 million cases, and COVID has dramatically worsened worldwide efforts to effectively treat and control this disease. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing multi-drug resistant parasites uh, predominate in Southeast Asia and emerge in Africa and other parts of the malaria endemic world. So I thought it was an important time to convene sort of leading experts in antimalarial drug resistance and therapeutics research and development to, uh, to come together and share ideas and, and data about how we can regain the upper hand against malaria uh, now and in the coming years. So I think our meeting is distinct in bringing together experts from industry as well as research groups located around the world, also in malaria endemic regions, to address the key issues we're confronting today in drug resistance and and how to discover and develop new antimalarial drugs. I think attendees can gain insights into this, the entire process from basic biology to drug discovery and development to its clinical implementation, to identifying treatment failures and developing strategies to treat multi-drug resistant malaria. It looks like a fantastic program. Um, what do you think are going to be the most exciting new advances and research directions that are going to be covered? So I think we'll learn about some powerful new screens and approaches that are being used now to explore drug mode of action and mechanisms of resistance, and also biological insights that, that the group is gathering or the investigators are gathering into the current drug discovery and development pipeline. Um, there's also some very powerful new cell-based assays that are identifying compounds with unique modes of action. So I think uh, we'll see a, a sort of panel of, of really exciting new technologies. Uh, and and really understand what new targets are emerging and how investigators are collaborating to, to really mine that data to advance the new the pipeline. Great. And what are you most interested in hearing about? Personally, I, I'm looking forward to learning about the chemogenomic approaches to understanding how antimalarials kill parasites and what strategies are being most actively pursued uh, in the field uh, and also um, uh, strategically to reduce the impact of malaria in the context of, of emerging already established drug resistance. You touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so what are the tools and technologies um, that are going to be covered that are enabling new advances in this area? So I think there are very powerful new cell-based assays to explore the liver stage specifically as a drug target. And there's some sophisticated chemical proteomics approaches to exploring drug modes of action that we'll hear about at this meeting. Uh, there's also, I think, some really interesting new chemogenomic approaches uh, and also the use of genetic crosses in these specialized mouse models that I think are providing important new insights into the parasite resistome, as we call it. So the capacity of the parasite to require resistance or tolerance to, to uh, different chemotypes or different modes of action. So I, I think we'll learn a lot about these new technologies and how they're being incorporated into sort of strategic uh, multi-investigator, multi-collaborative initiatives. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for, um, with all these technologies. Um, so who should attend uh, the meeting and what unique value do, the th do you think they'll derive from the meeting? So I think the meeting is ideally suited for graduate students and postdocs to meet each other and form connections and, and also meet faculty and leaders in the field. We've been uh, thoughtful about bringing in uh, a very international and very diverse group of investigators, uh, both in sort of the US and Europe and Australia and Southeast Asia and scientists also coming in from Africa and 
South America. So I think it's going to be a very international group. Uh, we have many of the real leaders in the field coming in. We also have people coming in from industries such as Nevada's, for example, uh, investigated um, also from um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and some of the sort of thought leaders really helping sort of promote um, the support of, of these initiatives. So I think that's going to be very useful for, for graduate students and postdocs because it still will be a fairly tight forum. You know, these are these huge, you know, meetings with thousands of individuals. So there'll be a lot of time for exchange. It's also a great opportunity, I think, for principal investigators to meet in person finally and, you know, um, get together and exchange data and ideas and initiate new collaborations. That's great to hear. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the status of um, drug resistance. So can you tell us a little bit about what is really happening with resistance uh, to artemisinin and globally? So as we know, artemisinin resistance was first detected clinically around 2008 in Southeast Asia and in, in Cambodia, and we've seen it sweep across uh, the region. Um, more recently, we've seen the primary partner drug for periquin fail, and that failed really in spectacular fashion. So it really only took a couple of years for that to go from the initial detection to the point of it being clinically, you know, highly ineffective. There was a report a couple of years ago showing that treatment efficacy could be as low as 13%, for example, in, in a study from Northeast Thailand. <clears throat> the concern always was going to be if and when it arose in Africa. And historically, as we know from past first line, former first line drugs like chloroquine and Fansadar, there was a delay of about a decade. And now we've seen clear evidence from Uganda and Rwanda that uh, resistance to the artemisinin uh, core compound of the current combination therapies has emerged in those areas. And so the concern being that twofold, one, that that will start to spread across uh, the continent. And that, of course, is where malaria has its greatest impact, the greatest burden of disease. And secondly, that it exposes the partner drugs to uh, greater selective pressure. And of course, if we lose our partner drugs, then we lose treatment efficacy. Yeah. And so far, uh, the major combination in Africa, which is COARTEM, which is artemether plus lumefantrine, has not failed uh, to levels that are, are being documented. Uh, so it seems we still have a window of opportunity there to continue effective treatment, but we anticipate that it'll be again a, a matter of time before the partner drug succumbs mm -hmm. as the parasite keeps looking for mechanisms of resistance. And so that's why these meetings, this meeting is important because what we're really trying to do is accelerate the discovery and development pipeline so that we're in a position to actually have drugs to use uh, if and when essentially the current first lines fail and need to be replaced. Right, so I was going to ask you a little bit about the biological function of Couch 13 now um, we're starting to, to get some insight into that. So do you think it's just going to be inevitable that malaria parasites will develop full-blown resistance to artemisinin, or do you think that, you know, they'll just have a, a lack of parasite fitness that will limit their transmission? So we know now that the Couch 13 mutations that drive artemisinin resistance are really quite stage-specific. They're only... Um, protecting these early rings that have just reinvaded red cells. They're not really helping protect against the later stages of the parasite as it matures. And it's to do with the function, with the mode of action of the drug, which is quite pleiotropic. So it can damage lipids, it can alkylate heme itself, it can damage proteins. So it's very non specific, it seems, in its mode of action. So this drug is really slowing down the act. The, this mutant gene is really just slowing down the activation of the drug and reducing its, its potency just in that early stage of the parasite. Uh, I don't yet see uh, evidence that the parasites biologically have acquired mechanisms that allow them to become even more resistant. At the moment, it's really just a tolerance state. They're able at a certain percentage to tolerate drug action for a short period of time, during a short period of its, of its intra-arethocytic cycle. I haven't seen evidence that it's figured out how to cope with drug action against the more mature trophozoite stage. So I'm not sure it'll fail. And, and as of, you know, the clinical consequence 
of the artemisin being compromised is, is not uh, as substantial as, of course, when the partner drug fails and then the combination of the two is what leads to treatment failure. So I don't think it's inevitable that artemisinins will, that parasites really will acquire full blown resistance to artemisinin. Um, and for now, because a lot of the, a drug like lumefantrine, you know, there is pharmacology at play. So far, parasites haven't figured out how to counter that. We haven't yet seen clear evidence that parasites are highly resistant to that. But again, with enough selection, with enough parasites, will we finally get there? That's, that's, that's um, one would predict that's gonna be the case. Yeah, so it's always important to have a, a nice pipeline behind us. So I guess, what do you see um, being the biggest challenges that are faced by scientists and people working out in the field with respect to, to drug resistance? And also what are the challenges faced by um, people who are trying to develop um, anti-malarial drugs? So I think in the field, what we've seen historically is that by the time sort of clinical evidence of resistance has emerged, uh, it's actually been quite predominant in the parasite population. So if you look back, for example, at artemisinin, and, you know, the reports of these del this delayed parasite clearance, that's sort of the diagnostic of reduced efficacy of artemisinin, and those reports came out sort of in 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. We know that now it's attributable to mutations in this gene K13. If we look historically, looking back in time at when those mutations actually arose in the parasite population, you know, we can see it back six, seven years. In fact, they were very, they were already, you know, robustly implanted in parasite populations by 2008. So there's always a lag time between when the parasites have acquired resistance and when it's actually become sort of public knowledge. I think that's a challenge because at the beginning, even when you see evidence in vitro that suddenly parasites, you know, they're less susceptible in your in vitro assay, or you're getting some evidence that clinically they're working less effectively less rapidly until you figure out what's driving resistance you don't know where to look in the parasite genome and so yeah. that's a huge challenge i think there are some new approaches to that like these genetic crosses are very effective in mapping resistance mm -hmm. uh, obviously these whole genome sequencing approaches are one way to do it but then you have to sort of dissociate just genetic diversity from what's actually driving resistance so you need sure. these huge data sets um, that creates all these logistic issues. How can you capture enough parasites to create the diversity? Working in the field, obviously, it's very specialized how you have to culture parasites. Can you cryopreserve them? You can get ex vivo data, but can you store the parasites? Can you get them shipped out, cloned and adapted? They don't adapt easily to culture. So I think there's a lot of scientific and logistic challenges just to being able to work with parasites in the field in a way where you can store those samples. Um, and then in terms of, uh, and also, you know, there's resource limitations involved as well. I think that's one of the great things about this meeting is it will allow investigators from malaria endemic regions to have access to um, sort of more senior investigators and be able to start discussions and, and collaborations. Yeah. Um, we know, for example, we have a lot more parasites from Southeast Asia than we do from Sub-Saharan Africa in labs that have been culture adapted and routinely used. That's improving, but, but that's really been a limitation, I think, in our understanding of what's happening in Africa. In terms of the challenges faced in antimalarial drug development, it's, it is really hard to bring drugs to market. I think, for example, the Malaria Drug Accelerator Consortium that's funded by the Gates Foundation and works very closely with Medicines for Malaria Venture has been a sort of great enterprise to, to uh, identify new targets and yeah. um, understand and use target-based approaches to trying to develop new chemotypes. But then we run into, you know, the classic issues. Do we have enough medicinal chemistry? There aren't many pharmacologists in the field. Industry has been much more responsive. But of course, you know, the margins aren't huge and, and there's only really a few companies that are really dedicating resources to this, um, such as Novartis and, and GSK, for example, uh, and Merck also, you know, there's other that have smaller programs, but it's, it's, it's a challenge to develop the antimalarial drugs because, you know, these are very large, high volume sort of low return, you know, projects. Yeah, of, course. Um, yeah. of course, the great thing is the community, I think in the last several years really has converged on the importance of doing this. And I think this 
meeting and the enthusiasm for the meeting is a reflection of of the enthusiasm from academia and also from from leaders in industry and also from the funders to really sort of go about this in a coordinated way yeah thanks for that so i guess you know with, there's been lots of past failures with um, malaria drug resistance so what can we do in the future to try and to try and counteract that emerging resistance to anti-malarials that, that emerge from the pipeline. You know, what have we actually learned from all those past failures? So I think uh, there's really an important need to understand mode of action. And I think we can leverage mode of action to uh, figure out how to overcome resistance in a sort of um, informed manner. So for example, we know that artemisium resistant parasites um, are very susceptible to inhibitors of the proteasome and that uh, targeting the proteasome synergizes with artemisinin even if it's acquired resistance to that compound. So I think those types of mechanistic studies have been really good at, at identifying potentially promising antimalarial combinations. So I think that's one approach and that's where there's a huge value in continuing the, to study the basic biology under, you know, underlying mode of action of these drugs. I think there's been a, a lot of uh, focus also on identifying novel targets so that we don't just keep putting into the marketplace drugs that will um, succumb to resistance. And the classic example, I think there is chloroquine and piperoquine. So they're both four minoquinolines. Uh, piperoquine was active against chloroquine resistant parasites. And yet when piperoquine resistance emerged, it used the same path as for chloroquine, which was it took this transporter in this case, PFCRT, and just laid on distinct mutations to achieve the same outcome, which was drug efflux. So, yeah. you know, I think there's been a desire to um, diversify the types of sort of therapeutic, inter you know, uh, checkpoints that, that we can target to come up with novel modes of action. The issue has been that a lot of the targets that have been identified in recent years um, can pretty easily mutate. And so resistance has really become an issue also in this sort of drug discovery and development landscape. So now there's um, pretty early assessment of resistance risks, risks to ensure that, you know, we're not moving, you know, a long way downstream in the development space with compounds that will sort of succumb yeah. to resistance easily in the field. Um, and so that I think is really helping inform uh, the selection of compounds that we can move forward, including, for example, these irresistible compounds where we don't know what their target is uh, and they, they have, may have multiple targets, but we know their resistance risk is less. So I think that's also a strategy that, that has been helpful as we explore sort of the parasite resistome and, and, uh, and then what we call the druggable genome. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, so finally, I guess, what do you think are areas of research that are are still underexplored in this space? And, and what do you think are the key knowledge gaps that are providing a barrier to, to drug development? So I think that there's still uh, a lot of, uh, I think our understanding of sort of parasite cell biology mm -hmm. uh, and biochemistry is, is still in its early days. So, you know, as we're looking at different uh, targets and, and different chemotypes and their modes of action, I think we're starting to build a, a better understanding of parasite metabolism and response to stress and this constant sort of balance between, you know, de novo biosynthetic pathways and salvage pathways and how can we, let, you know, which of those pathways are good sort of intervention points. So I think there's still a huge amount that we need to understand about just the core principles of parasite biology, its cell biology, its biochemical you know, networks, um, and really figuring out which of those are the most valuable from a sort of therapeutics perspective. Um, there's still a real shortage also in, in med chem and pharmacology, and there's still a need to continue to integrate sort of multidisciplinary approaches that combine all the different disciplines to really sort of home in on on what are the right uh, what are the right targets and the right chemical compounds, and how can we sort of you know continue to generate support for funding all of that essentially? Absolutely, that's great. So thanks 
uh, David, for all your insights um, in this area. And I just want to ask, are there any final comments that you would like to, to make about the conference or um, the area? So I, I think that, you know, malaria has really advanced quickly uh, in recent years. It has become more applied, but it's also, I think, become much more uh, multidisciplinary. I personally, I've been in this field for 30 years. Uh, I, you know, really appreciate the malaria research community because it is such a, a collaborative group of investigators, you know, with a common goal. The biology is fascinating. Uh, the epidemiology and, and, you know, issues of social inequity and access to healthcare. It's, it's a very rich field to explore um, intellectually. And I think it's a, a field that the malaria research community is really passionate about. And there's a lot of sharing of, of data and, and exchange of ideas. So I find it's a really rewarding community. I would definitely encourage people to, to look into it. I think it's a really important sort of area of, of public health need. Uh, I think it's going to be a very exciting meeting. I think we're all absolutely itching to, <laughs> to leave, um, you know, home and get out there and talk to scientists and spend a few days just, just thinking about science. Breckenridge is apparently gorgeous. Um, for people who want to ski, apparently it's still possible. Um, be warned that it's 9,000 feet or something ridiculous. So, you know, you might be panting for the first day or two. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's, it looks, there's a lot of excitement about uh, the meeting. A lot of interest in doing it. I, I think it's going to be really well attended, despite the challenges of COVID. Um, we're certainly going to do our best with with you know vaccine requirements and on-site testing and and just really maximising. Uh, and I also think we're going to be post the Omicron wave. So I'm hoping that mid April last year is going to be a sweet spot for that, in terms of of really having much less risk uh, at that time. So I'm excited. I think it's going to be a great meeting. I'm working with Kelly Chabali and Liz Ashley. We've been a really, um, it's been a really constructive uh, group to, to coordinate this meeting. Keystone and Symposia have been amazing and, and, and real professionals in, um, in putting this together. So um, hopefully it'll be a great turnout. I think it's gonna be a super meeting. Totally agree, David, about the malaria community and just how the field is just really pushing forward. I think it's a really exciting time. Um, I'll be live streaming on the other side of the world. Unfortunately, can't attend there in person. But yeah, I, I think I'll be up in the middle of the night watching because I think it's um, it's going to be a fabulous uh, program. So really appreciate uh, the three of you putting this program together. It looks fantastic. And, and thanks to Keystone for, for organising the conference as well. So thanks. Thank you.